Therefore, Naha of us, Ravan, your good self, Vai, certainly, Bhagavat, in relation with the personality of Godhead. Pradhanaha, chiefly, Mahatama, the greatest of all greats, Ekanta, exclusively, Parayanasha, of the shelter, Harehe, of the Lord. Udaram, impartial. impartial. Charitam, Charitam. activities. activities. Vishudam, Vishudam. Transcendental. transcendental. Vishushatam, Vishushatam. Those, who are receptive. those who are receptive. Naha, Naha. ourselves. ourselves. Vitano to, kindly describe. Vidvan, O learned one. So translation. O Sutta Goswami, you are a learned and pure devotee of the Lord because the personality of Godhead is your chief object of service. Therefore, please describe to us the pastimes of the Lord, which are above all material conception. For we are anxious to receive such messages. You can repeat. O Sutta Goswami, you are a learned and pure devotee of the Lord. You are a learned and pure devotee of the Lord. Because the personality of Godhead is your chief object of service. Therefore, please describe to us the pastimes of the Lord. Which are above all material conception. Which are above all material conception. For we are anxious to receive. For we are anxious to receive such such messages. Such messages. So purport praise, <coughs> divine grace, A C Bhakti Vinanta Swami, Shila Prabhupada, Shila Prabhupada Ki. Jai. To speak around the transcendental activities of the Lord should have only one object of worship and service, Lord Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And the audience for such topics should be anxious to hear about him. When such a combination is possible, namely a qualified speaker and a qualified audience, it is then and there very much congenial to continue discourses on the transcendence. Professional speakers and a materially absorbed audience cannot derive real benefit from such discourses. Professional speakers make a show of Bhagavat Saptaha for the sake of family maintenance. And the materially disposed audience hears such discourses of Bhagavat Saptaha for some material benefit, namely religiosity, wealth, gratification of the senses, or liberation. Such Bhagavatam discourses are not purified from the contamination of the material qualities, but the discourses between the saints of Naimisharanya and Sri Sutta Goswami are on the transcendental level. There is no motive for material gain in such discourses, and limited transcendental pleasure is cherished <coughs> both by the audience and by the speaker, and therefore they can continue the topics for many thousands of years. Now, Bhagavad Saptas are held for seven days only, and after finishing the show, both the audience and the speaker become engaged in material activities as usual. They can do so because the speaker is not Bhagavad Padana, and the audience is not Shushu Shatam, as explained above. So, Tanno bhavan vai bhagavat pratano mahattamai kanta parayanasya hare rudaram chatitam vishudam shushushatam no vitano to vidvan. So, Omagana Timidanda Shah, Dananjana Shlakaya Chakshurun Meditam Yena Tasmai Shigarve Namaha. So, for those of you who don't know what Bhagavad Saptahas are, because some we have some newer devotees here, uh, Sapta, of course, refers to uh, seven, and it's in relationship 
uh, this seven is in relationship to Maharaj Pariksit. Maharaj Pariksit was a great king, just to give a summary, and he was cursed to die in seven days because he was uh, offended a small brahmana, a, a brahmana's small son, whose name was Shringi, and because he had taken a snake, a dead snake, and put it around the head of this a young boy's father. And this is a pastime of the Lord. Normally, pure devotees don't do that. They don't take snakes and put it around people's necks, even if they're hungry or thirsty. But, you know, this is a pastime of the Lord. Just take it like that. It's not that he was in Maya, hungry, controlled by hunger or thirst. So, anyway, so he was cursed to die in seven days by the bite of a snake bird, a tukshika. And so, instead of taking some remedial measure, like most of us would do, isn't there some mantra I can chant? Some uh, gem I can wear on my finger. Isn't we go to the astrologers? Navaratna. Navaratna, it's called. Uh, what gem should I wear to counteract that? And so you see some nice devotees with rings on all their fingers, or some of their fingers, <laughs> and they're counteracting it, and they're performing this puja and that puja. Oh my God! I suppose I remember an astrologer once predicted. Several astrologers predicted I was supposed to die when I was 55. So I didn't do any sacrifices, <coughs> believe me. I was just counting down the days, you know. When do I get to go back to Godhead? 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. It was like the rocket that never blasted off. <laughs> <laughs> you know, sometimes you see these rockets at Cape Canaveral. In the old days, they, they ignited and it just goes, bleh, poof. So it was like that, you know, 55, what happened? I didn't die. Or maybe I am dead and I just haven't realized it yet. <laughs> or maybe my material life has died. You know, there's so many ways to interpret astrology, actually. You know, someone said one year, uh, many astrologers said, this is going to be the worst year of your life. This is actually the best year of my life. I had more realization that year than any other year. They said, well, what about Rao? What about your Saturn period? Well, actually, I'll tell you an interesting story about Saturn. It has nothing to do with this verse. And Hanuman. Once upon a time, Hanuman is the monkey uh, soldier that assisted Lord Ram. So once upon a time, uh, <laughs> Hanuman uh, was approached by Saturn, and Saturn said, it's your time. Everybody knows that, you know, Shani, the period you're supposed to have when everything goes wrong. What's that rule? If something can go wrong, it will go wrong. Murphy's Law. Murphy's Law. So if something's going to go wrong, it will go wrong. So... Hanuman was approached, Saturn and said, yeah, it's your time, Hanuman. Hanuman said, I accept gladly. Uh, please sit on my head. And, you know, go affect me, sit on my head. So Hanuman was very intelligent. And what he did is he put a lot of mountains on his head, too, on top of Saturn. <laughs> this is an interesting story. And so Saturn was basically... Uh, had his own Saturn period. <laughs> you understand? He was uh, pretty much harassed. And uh, he said, Hanuman, how can you do this? And Hanuman said, all right. If you agree just to bother me for a few seconds, then I'll let you go. <laughs> so the moral, <laughs> the moral of the story is, if you worship Hanuman, devotees. Hanuman is a pure devotee of the Lord. And the devotees of the Lord and worship Krishna and chant Hare Krishna, you don't have to worry about those things. And sometimes inauspicious things become auspicious. Anyway, getting back to the story of Maharaj Pariksit, he just accepted this as special mercy. Uh, special mercy means when the Lord does something to really help you in devotional service that when you didn't expect it to happen. And so... Uh, he was cursed to die in seven days, and he thought, wow, this is great. Why is it great? Because in this way, he would know exactly when he was going to die. 
We do not know exactly <laughs> when we're going to die, in spite of all the astrologers' predictions. Mm. Just like I was talking to Yogindra the other day. And Yogindra says, where are you going to go in the final moments of your life? Uh, are you going to go like six months before you die to Dovrdan? And I said, no, I'll just go like a few days. <laughs> <laughs> and then it was interesting. You remember the conversation? Yeah. And, it, it, and he said, But how do you know? They said, Well, if I die anywhere, it's all right. And also, I said, If I go a few, he says, If you go a few days, maybe they won't let you into India. I said, I'll figure it out at that point. <laughs> we had this discussion. So, uh, so basically, it's, it's good to know exactly when, you, exactly when you're going to die. We don't. And uh, so Maharaj Pariksit knew, and there's also there's a famous story of Maharaj Katvanga. Katvanga Maharaj had been fighting on behalf of the demigods, you know, the powerful, good side of the force people. And he was fighting on behalf of them, and they said, you, we'll give you a benediction. Uh, and anything you want, you can have. Pretty good. And he said, I simply want to know when I'm going to die. And so what happened? He came down immediately to the earth planet, took shelter of Krishna, went back to home, back to Godhead. So it's actually a blessing to know in the exact moment you're going to die. Don't take, it, don't take this in your own hands and say, I know the exact moment I'm going to die. <laughs> Boom! That doesn't work. Then you go become a ghost. You become, if you do that, you will become a ghost, a Brahma Rakshasa. And then you'll harass the devotees who don't chant Hare Krishna nicely. <laughs> Brahma Rakshasa. Anyway, they're very powerful. Ravana was a Brahma Rakshasa, you know. He was a cross between a Brahman and a Rakshasa. His mother was a, Raksh a demon, Rakshasa, and his father was uh, Vishravas, actually a very saintly personality. But he just fell in love. You gotta worry about, it. you gotta be careful about falling in love. Because you may fall in love with a Rakshasa, or Rakshasini, as the case may be. So, uh, anyway, so it's actually good to know when you're going to die. So Pariksit Maharaj just said, this is great. He renounced everything, and he went to speak to the sages and the Bhagavad <laughs> and he said, you know, what should I do at the time of death? And they had some discussion. That, you know, some of them knew, some of them were speculating. And then along comes uh, Shukadeva Goswami. Shukadeva Goswami had just uh, learned the Bhagavatam and he was going out on his first Sankirtan excursion. <laughs> it's described that he was born when he was 16 years old. That's a big pregnancy, you know. In those days, they didn't have C-sections. <laughs> so anyway, so he's 16 years old. Finally, he was convinced to come out when he heard the pastimes of Krishna. And then his, he left his father. But later on, as described, he went back to his father <laughs> and learned the Srimad Bhagavatam from his father. It's, that's in the Bhagavatam. It's not that he left and immediately went out to preach. But he learned the Srimad Bhagavatam. And then he was sent out in Sankirtan. So his first Sankirtan day was preaching to uh, Maharaj Pariksit, who was... Uh, sitting in the bank of the Ganges, you know, fasting to the time of death. And Jugadev Goswami comes, and he's still only 16 years old, and he's not wearing any clothes, and people don't really, the general mass of people don't, general, don't understand, you know, what is his position? You know, here's a naked guy, you know, in the, in the uh, Western world we call that streaking. <laughs> Isn't it? Yeah. So, I mean, people just didn't understand. People were making fun and throwing things at him. But when he arrived, all the sages could understand he was a great devotee. I mean, he had his physiognomy was indicative of a great personality. There's different ratios in the body that indicate that someone is a great personality. You know, the hands are a certain length. They go down to the knees when one's standing up. That's one ratio. And, you know, the eyes go 
a little bit fur much further than any of our eyes. We just have beady eyes. And uh, they're almost like very lotus-like eyes. And so, so it's very beautiful. So they could see from the physiognomy, and also they knew it was Vyasadeva's son, and also they knew they were self-realized sages. So they all got up and offered respect to this personality, and then he sat on the asana and began to teach the Bhagavatam uh, to Maharaj Pariksit. And he taught it for seven days. So Maharaj Pariksit, instead of, uh, let us say, uh, <coughs> making some remedial measure, he just said, well, listen to the Bhagavatam. And when it came time, he uh, accepted the bite of the snake bird, Takshika, who came in like an apple. He was like a, he appeared as a, uh, a little worm in an apple and just jumped out of the apple and bit Maharaj Pariksit. Actually, there's a whole story that on, on his way to bite Maharaj Pariksit, he ran into his father, Kashyapa Muni. The story's there in the Bhagavatam. And Kashyapa Muni had the remedial measure for poison. And Kashyapa Muni said, you know, I can cure Maharaj Pariksit even after he's bitten. And uh, Tachika said, prove it. And uh, Kashapa said, all right, uh, burn this tree down with your poison. So he burned a tree down with his poison. And Kashapa Muni uh, threw some whatever it was, a mantra, whatever, and the tree came back to life. So there's, there's actually a description in the Mahabharata about this that Takshika was quite upset that it wasn't going to work, his poison. So he uh, sort of bribed Kashyapa <laughs> gave him a donation. Of course, that's pretty much the standard in many places in India. Anyway, he convinced him that this was Krishna's plan. That's, that's the real story. He convinced him because Ashi Kashyapa couldn't be bribed. So he uh, convinced Kashyapa Muni, and then he went, and <coughs> he was going to bite Maharaj Pritchett. Actually, before Maharaj Pritchett got bitten, he taught the essence of the Srimad Bhagavatam to his mother. He was a good son. And that's called the Bhagavatam Rita, which is written by uh, Sanatana Goswami, the Brihad Bhagavatam Rita, so, which is a very beautiful book that's been published in Iskand, translated by Gopi Paranadana Prabhu, my dear god brother who passed away a number of years ago. So anyway, so after seven days, he got bit, and Parikshit Bharaj went back to Gandhi. So that's the beginning of Bhagavat Saptaha you know, the seven days of the Srimad Bhagavatam. So, uh, modern day people, uh, they imitate that. Uh, they say, we're going to have, it's very popular in India, of course, that great uh, dramatic personalities, and I'm using the word dramatic personalities, I'm not criticizing them, I guess I am, but great, <laughs> great personalities who are very expert in drama, they perform these Bhagavad Saptahas. And they really concentrate on the 10th canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, particularly Krishna's relationship with the gopis. And they do it in a very dramatic fashion. I've seen them. They have, uh, the people come to the Bhagavad Saptahas, and of course, the, mostly the ladies are up front, the men are in the back. And in the middle of describing some pastime, let's say they're talking about uh, Krishna lifting Govardhan Hill. I'm not going to be so intimate to talk about the gopis today. But anyway, let's say they're talking about uh, Krishna lifting Govardhan Hill, and all of a sudden they'll break into song. It's like a Broadway musical. Wow. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty cool. They'll break into song. Govinda Jai Jai Go. Like Indian music. <laughs> Gopal Jai. <laughs> you heard them like that, haven't you? Of course, they're a little more expert than me. <laughs> hey, wait a second. <laughs> wait a second. I was just doing it. I can do it really, but I'm just doing it in jest. So they, they, they chant like that, and everyone in, in the audience are going and doing it too. Go, go, go. Radha Ramana Hari Govinda Jai. <laughs> and it's like, wow, it's just, 
really entertaining. It's really entertaining. Uh, and they keep the audience's attention. Actually, when they do talk about the other parts of the Bhagavatam, the audience goes out and eats. You know, because you, I've seen at other times of the day when the other parts of the Bhagavatam, other than, if they do, other parts of the Bhagavatam, it's pretty vacant in the tent. They set up these giant pondels, it's called. It's pretty vacant. But, but when they get to the evening, the evening's when they get into the nectar, then that's when they go for it. You know, go in. You know, it's, uh, I guess it's, it's the Indian equivalent of you know, some of the uh, preachers that we have in the West that make a lot of money. I mean, it, it, drama really draws people in. I mean, I was just sent a video of a, of a Western preaching event, not Hare Krishna, fortunately, where, and I showed it to Yoginja, right? Where, the, <laughs> where the, the minister has everyone, it's even more dramatic than the Indian Bhagavad stuff does. The minister has everyone like rolling on the ground and, and laughing and jumping up and down. Ooh, like. I said, you know, so it's passion. It's really passion. Because really Krishna's pastimes and Krishna's holy name have to descend. You know, they can't just like, it's not like you can understand it. But just like someone goes to Vrindavan, for example. And Vrindavan is covered with a layer of uh, yoga maya, you know, that if you're not ready, you don't see the real Vrindavan. You just see the pigs and the dogs and the hogs and everything like that. And it's interesting, too, you know. I think monkeys are quite interesting. <laughs> you know, I even had a picture of myself with, with millions of monkeys around and sent it to my mother because I thought she'd appreciate it. So, because <laughs> when I was young, we would go to Florida. Florida, there's this place called Monkey Jungle. And I would go there and, you know, my mother would take me. I said, look, now I'm in Monkey Jungle again. <laughs> so they, they see Vrindavan just as Monkey Jungle. And it, it's not, you know, there's something happening that you can't see, or I oh, can't see, maybe you can see it. But right below the surface is a, probably said there's a veneer. Veneer means like a covering like if you have, sometimes you have cheap wood. I don't know if any of this wood's cheap wood. But it's a covering, so it makes wood look expensive when it's actually cheap. It's just chip wood or something like that. So there's a, there's a very thin covering of, of this maya that keeps people from seeing. So in the same way, when there's Krishna Kata that's not being recited by the proper <laughs> reciter, then... He's at, the person's actually coming in touch with Maya, or the modes of nature. You know, like that verse, uh, that Putam Harikatam Ritam Shabana Naivakartagam Sharpo Chisti Yatapayam Vaishnava Mukot, you know. That when you hear about Krishna from someone who is not free from the motivation of uh, self service, then it may have poisonous effects. In other words, the modes of nature are there. So, really, that's not, I mean, that's criticizing every Bhagavad's up to person, but Prabhupada here comments on this. Uh, and the people are not really coming there to enjoy Krishna Kata. They're coming there to enjoy a dramatic performance in the name of Krishna Kata. I mean, maybe some people. It's not, don't want to generalize, say everyone. So, and, uh, and the person who is performing it, let's talk about motivation. It was interesting, when I was in university studying psychology, I took some courses in motivation. You know, what motivates people. So, there's different things that motivate different people according to the modes of nature. Of course, generally, in the Bhagavad Saptaha thing, the reciter is motivated let's say, profit, adoration, distinction. Profit meaning not only money, but just like you really, like if you're a dramatist, you really like it when everyone claps for you. Just like if you win the Sankriton Marathon and you're given a certain, <laughs> I'm not saying that's bad, and you're given a prize and everyone goes, Jai, oh, he's so great. Or you get, you get a trophy, trophy. 
When I was young, I got trophies for things. Not for chanting, but you know, I had certain sporting things that I did, and I got trophies, and everyone puts them up. And I, I remember there was one lady who joined the movement. She was an expert debater. And I asked her, did they give you a trophy with a big mouth on it? <laughs> 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 you know, because you have golf, you have you know, golf club and baseball, you have a baseball bat and I guess debating, just a big fat mouth. Anyway, <laughs> so, so profit adoration distinction. Of course, that, as we know, that's subtle sex life. Wait, mode of passion. It says a mode of passion. That you want people to, love, to appreciate you, not just love. I mean, of course, we do want people to love us and we want Christians to love us and love in exchange, that's fine. But just to get adulation, praise. You know, of course, there's that statement that he who praises me is my enemy, right? He who chastises me is my friend. I got a lot of friends. <laughs> so, <laughs> not so many enemies. Anyway, so, uh, so, so they're enjoying very much. Like an, a dramatist enjoys very much being on the stage. It's just, you know, there's a certain kick to it, you know, a certain high to it. And, of course, there's the money, too, which is also a good high. <laughs> they make a lot of money. And uh, so, so it's very mixed motives. So it's a mode of passion. So let's talk about motives. I want to talk about motives because in regard to preaching Krishna consciousness. Like, there's different motives that one may have in preaching Krishna consciousness in the modes of nature, and there may be transcendental motives. So, of course, uh, in, in the mode of ignorance, you may be just trying, well, pay for my prasadam or something like that, so I can eat at the end of the day or just like, whatever. Uh, and the mode of passion, because you want to, want to win the Sankirtan marathon, want to be considered the best. And the mode of goodness, you're thinking yourself as the benefactor of all these people. That's like a very subtle thing. Like charity in the mode of goodness is charity, of course, the Bhagavad Gita describes without any gross ulterior motive, but you do have the, it makes you feel good. In the mode of goodness, you become entangled by uh, the sense of happiness. Krishna describes that in the Gita. You actually you become entangled by a sense of material happiness. Like you look up in the sky and see the stars. I'm not saying we shouldn't look up in the sky and see the stars. I mentioned yesterday I did that. <laughs> so look, and you just say, oh, it's beautiful, but there's no God. That's the mode, material mode of goodness. Oh, it's so beautiful, sunset's so beautiful, this, this, that is so beautiful. But it's no, it's not, like Krishna says in the 10th chapter of the Gita, whatever glorious manifestations there are springs from but a spark of my splendor. It's interesting, the 10th chapter of the Gita, Krishna gives a whole list of all these opulences, and then he says, what is the use of it? all this explanation at the end of the 10th chapter? <laughs> because, of, you know, just from practically an insignificant spark of my splendor, these things are manifest. Anyway, so... Uh, so that's mode of goodness, and the mode of uh, transcendental mode, which is described here. Actually, you got this word in the verse. Vishuddha. Uh, okay, here we go. Vishuddha means transcendental, like Vishuddha Shaka. You understand? Shuddha, or Shuddha, is just the mode of goodness. But Vishuddha transcendental means the motivation. Here, this is described here. Uh, it says, because the personality, this is in the translation, because the personality of God is your chief object of service. What that means is his motivation is simply to please Krishna mm -hmm. and bring me people to Krishna consciousness because that pleases Krishna. But everything's centered on pleasing Krishna and on the spiritual master, which is not different than pleasing Krishna. So, hmm. That's the transcendental mode of goodness, the motivation. I mean, you can be doing the same thing, uh, but it's a question of the motivation. Actually, the motivation determines whether it's bhakti yoga or just karma yoga, too. 
you know, Karmio, you can be doing everything for Krishna, but your motivation may not be that. It may be just like, well, let me free myself from all my sinful activities. I mean, of course, the, Krishna understands that. In the Gita, he says, Chaturvidhavajantivam. People come to him because they have these other motivations. You know, they're looking for wealth. That's passion, right? Mm -hmm. As far as I know. Uh, they're, uh, they're in distress. Mm -hmm. You know, they're a relief of distress. You know, a mixture of passion and goodness. Uh, uh, they're looking for knowledge. You know, that's also, I guess it's some goodness there. Yeah, it's goodness, generally, material goodness. They're looking for knowledge, uh, or they're inquisitive. That's a little goodness there. So, Krishna understands... Oh, you got to cook the Rajboga. Okay. That's nice. So their motivation is good. They're not running away because... <laughs> Because they don't like me, but <laughs> they have to serve Krishna. So, uh, you know, Krishna understands when people have all these other motivations. So the question is, how do we have the right motivation, I mean, right, in terms of how do we have the Vishuddha Sattva motivation when we're pleasing Krishna, when we're not on that platform? Hmm. You know, we're probably on the platform, and, you know, Rajaguna, if we're lucky. And uh, maybe, you know, a little mixture of goodness there. Anyway, so, so how do we have that motivation? Well, I was thinking about this. Because basically, I mean, we have to be honest. Uh, we're not on the platform of the Dhanam, the Janam, the Sundarim, Kavitam, Va, Jagadish, Kamaya, Mama Janmani, Janmani, Shri, Bhavatad, Bhakti, Hui, Tuki, Chway. I mean, anyone here on that platform? Of course, if you were, you wouldn't say so. That's a trick question. <laughs> if you were actually on that platform, you'd be so humble you'd say no. So, but if, uh, anyway, so how do we do it? And, you know, because we're asked to go out and preach. We're asked to serve Krishna. We're asked to do bhakti yoga. You know, to do, serve Krishna with the motivation of trying to please him. That's bhakti yoga, basically. Karma yoga is... Serving, you know, offering it, all that you do, offer, all that you offer, should be done as an offering to Krishna. But that's, in one sense, external without the right motivation. So, my conclusion, actually the conclusion of the Acharyas is, that that's why we have a spiritual master. So the spiritual master, we can relate to. I mean, I, in my particular situation, I mean, I could relate to Prabhupada very nicely, but Krishna is really up there. You know, he's control. you know, like I said, I was describing, you know, he's controlling everything going on in the cell, everything going on in the atom. You know, I can't, and, and it was described in a previous verse that his, his glories are unlimited. It says, his transcendental attributes cannot even be measured by such masters of mystic powers as Lord Shiva and Lord Brahma. And I ain't on the level of Lord Shiva and Lord Brahma, I assure you. So, how do we understand Krishna? We understand Krishna through Krishna's devotees, really. I mean, that's, to me, you know, Prabhupada, I mean, he's a pure devotee. But I'm not saying I understand Prabhupada fully, but I can relate to Prabhupada. You know, I can see he's an example of Bhagavad Gita in action. He's the personification, in one sense, of the Bhagavad Gita. So how do you understand Sarva Dharman Paricha Jamami Kam Shadanam Braja? What does it mean? I mean, I know what it means, but how does it mean practically? And then you just see Prabhupada. What does it mean? Well, Prabhupada got the order from his guru, go to the Western world, preach Krishna consciousness, success potency is built into the order of the spiritual master. Bingo, as they say. Some of you may not know what that word bingo means. Bingo means you've hit the jackpot, basically. Bingo is a game where a bunch of old ladies, you know, <laughs> are playing at the neighborhood church. You know, A13 or something like that. Oh, no, not A13, there's no A in bingo. B13, sorry. So, so, uh, so that's it. 
you know, we have to understand Srila Prabhupada. That was the conclusion, understand, for all of us, understand Srila Prabhupada. And we think of pleasing Prabhupada, and we know what pleases Prabhupada, and it's very practical, it's modern, it's down to earth. Wow. And then we develop a relation with Prabhupada and other advanced devotees, and we serve the Vaishnavas, Mahatseva Mahorvi Muktes, as described in the Bhagavatam, by serving a Mahatma, a great soul, and the door to liberation, a Horvi Muktes, the door to liberation is open. So, to me, that's the secret of having the right motivation and being a proper, uh, transparent medium for giving Krishna consciousness to others. Because we are asked to sit here, just like I'm sitting here on this seat, you know, Vyasasana. Normally the requirement is that to sit on the Vyasasana, you have to be free from all material desires. So if we, if we actually had that absolute requirement here, you know, posted, pictured, uh, assigned, do not sit here unless you're free of all material desires. You have no other desire other than to serve the Lord. You've never thought of anything else. Uh, you're not at all self-centered. Please do not sit in this seat. It will be a great offense, and you will go to hell. So, <laughs> the seat, it would be vacant. I mean, it's a thing. Just, <coughs> you know, I would certainly be scared. And even if you were pure, you wouldn't think you're pure, right? I mean, even if you were on the level, you, you, I'm not going near that seat. That's a dangerous seat. That's a hot seat. <laughs> You'll go to hell. I mean, it's just, just like Prabhupada said, that if the GBC, one of his GBC members makes a mistake, he has to take birth as a shudra in his next life. So that's a really discouraging statement. Uh, and if someone's temple president, they have to take the reactions of whatever is going on in the temple, like a king has. Let me remain a simple, humble brahmachari, you know, and wash the pots, you know. So, uh, no, because if we can actually think like that, you know, why are we doing this? And just a, another thing, you know, the preaching of Krishna consciousness, I just want to end with this, should never be done for the idea of making money. It's not that you go and give a lecture because you're thinking of the money that's going to be there. And the money should go to Krishna anyway. And I'll end with one story from the, uh, let's see, uh, this story is from uh, Bhaktivinoda Thakur's Jaiva Dharma. And once upon a time, as all stories go, there was a Brahman who preached Krishna consciousness. His name was Brajanath. Some of you may know this story, but anyway, if you've read the, the uh, Jaiva Dharma. So the Brajanath went to his guru, his Siksha guru, and he said, Guru Maharaj, I make my living by giving Bhagavatam class, basically preaching, and people give me money. He was a householder who was getting money from that. And Guru Maharaj said, no. Make your money in some other way. Do some business, even, even if you're Brahman. Do some business, but don't make your money through your preaching because there's a, there's a tendency to have ulterior motives. Uh, if one is making something for oneself out of one's spiritual activities. I mean, it's, it, it's a great danger. So one has to be very, very careful of motivation. That was the point. Very, very careful of motivation. If one wants to become a pure devotee of the Lord and not just like spin his wheels or her wheels for the next 10,000 lifetimes. All right, any other questions? Oh, other questions, are the qu are questions. <laughs> questions, comments, arguments, problems, issues, requests, yes? The seven day Bhagavatam discourses are so popular in India that there are several this kind of only to do them. Yeah. Take advantage of that popularity and change the Bhagavatam according to Shiva Prabhupada's teachings. Yeah, they're using that as sort of a trick. It's not that they're actually doing the same thing as the Bhagavad Saptaha people are doing, but they're labeling it like that. Just like devotees sometimes will say, well, we're going to teach. I mean, I have one disciple, for example, 
and he teaches Hatha Yoga. He's actually the, I would say he's probably among the top five yogis in the world, as far as asanas are concerned. He does things that other yogis have told me are impossible. But anyway, so he teaches yoga and he makes devotees. You know, so what he's doing is when he's teaching yoga, he's using that as a trick. And he, he, he sort of screens the people he's teaching yoga to and sees who can become devotee. And he's made like, in over the last year, this is interesting, he's made in the, over the last year about 20 devotees from all over the world. He's, he's actually quite famous. He has uh, yoga schools in many different countries. And uh, he makes the devotees, and, and they're, he's like their Siksha guru, and I'm their Diksha guru. You know, it's just, I mean, just like I, I was in Mexico, and I, I was one of the people he made, initiated by me, very nice, really nice, intelligent person. So anyway, so devotees sometimes use <coughs> something to attract people, like labeling or something like that, or like Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur said, if you want to keep a devotee, you give him balam rice with ghee on it. I'm sure you've heard that story before. Mm -hmm. No, you haven't? Yes? No. Okay. So once upon, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur said, if we want to keep the devotees, he told a story to illustrate how to keep devotees. He said, once upon a time, there was a man who couldn't keep his servants. The servants kept running away because it was a little tough on him. <laughs> Didn't pay him that much. And he went to his friend and he said, you know, how can I keep my servants? You know, every two weeks I'm losing a servant. And the man, his friend, said, you have to feed them uh, like basmati rice. You don't know what balam rice is, but it's like basmati rice, real fancy rice. You have to feed them uh, basmati rice with a lot of ghee on it. Do that for about three weeks. So he kept feeding them basmati rice with you know, tons of ghee. I don't know if any of you remember when we first joined the movement, everything had ghee on it. <laughs> and it's, you know, it's addictive. And so what happened is he did that, and after three weeks, he stopped feeding the guy, uh, his servant. And the servant went away for one day, and he came right back. Because <laughs> he couldn't forget the taste. <laughs> so in the same way, when to track people to Krishna consciousness, we give them really opulent food in the beginning. And after a while, just some dried bread bowls. Ah, oh, sorry. <laughs> no. Now when you get older, you discover you can, cannot eat like that anymore. Unless you want to have your Bhagavad Saptaha very quickly. <laughs> you die. So, so, so in other words, to introduce people to Krishna consciousness, we don't so much preach that they should follow the footsteps of the six Goswamis of Vrindavan. You know, after a while, naturally, renunciation manifests itself in the heart. As one is progressing, Vasudevi Bhagavati Bhakti Yoga Prayojita Janayati Asu Bhairagyam Gyam Chalyada Haitakam. It happens naturally. So there so in presenting Krishna consciousness, sometimes, you know, we advertise yoga or Bhagavad Sapta, but the preaching always has to be pure. And the motivation of the person who is doing it can't be uh, pecuniary or financial. It has to be a pure, uh, pure motivation. You know, like Prabhupada one time, he said, chant Hare Krishna and stay high forever. You know, what does stay high mean? <laughs> you know, my generation, uh, yeah, my generation is the hippie generation, being high meant, you know, taking drugs. <laughs> you know, sometimes the people, I remember watching people who were taking uh, LSD one time. And it wasn't me. One, and they were taking it. <laughs> and one person was saying to the other, are you high yet? Have you gotten off yet? <laughs> Not yet. I'm just waiting. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it takes time to act. Anyway, don't try it. 
So, so Prabhupada said, stay high forever. And you can. In Krishna consciousness, by chanting the Lord's holy names, and really high. I mean, taking drugs is stay low forever. It's like the subterranean heavenly planets, you know, something like that. That you think you're in heaven, but all that you have are, are, are lights lit by snakes, jewels on their hoods. So any other questions, comments, arguments, problems? Hmm. Yes? Maharaj, you were talking a little bit about um, like people that, like sometimes how we feel that like this maybe we even may recognize yeah. or, you know, um, notice and mm -hmm. things like that. And you were saying that's in the mode of passion. That's passion, yeah. And so... Um, it's I, mixed. I, I, could you Elaborate on that a little bit more. Well, if you read the third canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, Lord Kapila Dave really elaborates on that. He talks about devotional service in different modes of nature. The motivation or the goals of devotees in different <laughs> modes. So, one should be honest with oneself. I mean, a, a sage is sometimes described as being introspective. That means honest. You know, what is my motivation? Why am I doing this? I mean, not that you feel guilty while I'm doing this because I like winning the trophy. But at least understand what your motivation is. And also it helps you be humble. You don't have to beat yourself up, feel guilty. Oh no, I'm useless, I'm hopeless, I'm worthless. I'm a dog, a worm in a dog stool. <laughs> That's about as bad as you can get. You know, be aware of it. Pure devotee stool is kind of cute, kind of nice. <laughs> but in a dog stool, I mean, that's yuck. So uh, you don't want to get into that, you know, because that, that's simply self-centeredness. You know, depression is another uh, type of self-centeredness. People depressed, you can see they use the personal pronouns quite a bit in their speech. I, me feel, etc. So uh, just realize, you know, I'm not on the highest level, then you pray to Krishna. Just one day I hope to come to the highest level, you know, associate with Prabhupada and hearing Prabhupada and, and so, you know, this will probably come to the highest level. You know, what do they say? Failure is the pillar of success. So if you, you, know, you, you take your lackings, you know, how you're lacking in, not you, of course, but speaking rhetorically, how someone is lacking in their spiritual progress. You take it as a, as a challenge. You know, take it as a challenge. There, I often tell devotees there's no problems, there's only challenges and opportunities. So even our own lack of Krishna consciousness is a challenge. It's like a Kshatriya challenge, isn't it? Wow, I'm not Krishna conscious. Well, I got a lot to do. Joy, let me work at it. Otherwise, if, if you think you're Krishna conscious, there's, there's no challenge, there's no impetus. You just sit back in your whatever and, you know, drink the nectar drink. <laughs> the Kool-Aid. Anyways. <laughs> yeah. What about the, the peace person that would be like always wanting or expecting praise, you know, uh, kind of that attention seeker? You know, how do you... Um, well, that's... How do you deal with it? Well, that's... How do you all right. Deal with it? How do you Okay, so that, that involves, well, now we're going to morph into psychology. And in my book, I talk about that. So uh, everybody at all times is actually acting according to the different needs that they have. And uh, if someone appears to be asking for attention, uh, they have some need. You know, one of the basic, probably one of the basic needs, you know, like love. Or, and, and that's not, there's nothing wrong with that. And all those needs can be fulfilled in the Krishna conscious way. But not that you feel that it's your responsibility to be fulfilling other people's needs. It's called codependency. You, but you can help the person understand, if you read my book, you'll understand that. Help, you can facilitate people in understanding what their needs are 
and them coming up with strategies to fulfill those needs. Because if you give people the strategies, they don't own the strategies. People have to own them. But, but to help them understand, you know, you have a need for love. You know, maybe you want to get a teddy bear. I don't know. <laughs> or get married or whatever, you know, or make friendship. You don't have to suggest that. But they just have to know that, and not be embarrassed about their needs. I mean, sometimes you hear people criticize others and say, you are very needy. But everybody's needy. You know, we have a need for fun, recreation, friendship. I, I'm needy for air. <laughs> <laughs> and light. And prasada, food. You know, I, I'm admitting. I mean, I'm living with this body. So why don't, why don't we just admit our basic needs? And some people have more of one basic need than another, or it manifests or morphs in a different way. But that's life. So, so to help them understand and let them come up with a solution. Your solution for them is no solution. They, they're the ones who have to understand, you know, why they're doing something. And, 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 and it's also important when dealing with them not to label them and say, and, and, and think, oh, she's an emotional drain. You know, then, then you just see them as a big drain, a walking drain, <laughs> a walking vacuum, basically emotional vacuum. <laughs> Yeah, so it, it, it's really important. I mean, it, it takes some work. I mean, if you get a copy of my book, it'll help with that. You have a copy, right? Yeah, you have a copy, really. So it's not a, you know, it really helps. I mean, uh, and actually, it's, it's not just some modern philosophy I'm preaching, you know, based on Maslow. It's, it's actually something that Bhaktivinoda Thakur also talked about. <coughs> And it's uh, Chaitanya Shikshamrita that we all have basic needs. All of our basic needs have to be satisfied if we're going to progress in spiritual life. Because if, if you take away my air, I ain't going to be a chanting Hare Krishna too well. <laughs> and I'm not going to be able to think of Krishna if I can't breathe. And if I'm hungry, I'm not going to be able to think of Krishna. You know, the stomach's going to be talking louder than my chapa. <laughs> so... Uh, it's important to recognize those basic needs. Those needs are not detrimental to Krishna consciousness when the strategies are in tune with Krishna consciousness. Does that make sense? The needs are just needs, you know, whatever. And, but the strategies we have to, don't have to, but if we want to be Krishna conscious, we develop strategies that are consistent with our Krishna consciousness. As that's now. And, you know, if someone is doing his Sankirtan because he likes the praise, that person may be on that platform, may need that appreciation at that particular point. Uh, but they should be introspective to realize that and not be embarrassed. You know, admit, admit whatever faults we have. And what's the problem? What's the problem? I, mean, I don't, I don't want to see myself as being faultless. And then, then you have to really come up to that mark all the time. Then it's, it's so much anxiety to think of yourself as having no faults, isn't it? <laughs> it's a lot easier. Well, I'm full of faults. Boy, I can relax now. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, you know, you made a mistake. So what? I made a mistake. I'll try my best next time. But, you know, whatever. I'm not a pure devotee. It's, it's, it's really hard to be... <laughs> Think of oneself as a pure devotee because then uh, it's too big a strain. Better be just a servant of a pure devotee. So, any other questions? Yes? Dai Maharaj, nice to see you again. Nice to see you too. I, I, I was able to catch a couple of your classes after that. Uh, concerning the point that you said um, about the prestige, looking for prestige, reputation, or whatever. Yeah. I heard that in Krishna consciousness also that it's a good pride, that it's a good spiritual pride, like from your 
from develop from performing these surgeries? It yeah, looking for appreciation from the pure devotees, yes. Like from Prabhupada, like you know, to be patted on the head by Prabhupada or the guru to say, Good boy or good girl. <laughs> Hate to use that expression. But you know, I, I would love like Prabhupada to say, Well, thank you very much, you did a nice service, yeah. But to get the adulation from the crowd, you know, and become popular or something like that. I mean, it's not wrong to be popular, but the motivation, that's what we're talking about. Yeah, we should want the approval of the Vaishnavas. That is true. But the approval is different from the praise, you know, the effusive praise. Now, if you really want to get technical, there's a difference between praise and appreciation. We have a need for appreciation, but appreciation is quite different than praise. Praise is just the general thing. Like, you are so great, you are so wonderful, you're the best Sankar Don devotee. Appreciation should be something like, thank you for distributing 10,000 Bhagavad Gita's over the month of December, and I, and I really am happy with this, it, it pleases Prabhupada. That's like appreciation. But praise, praise is like a general thing. So I, I'm really getting more specific now. Like, you're great. Here he is, the great. You know, like if I'm thinking, here's the great Bear Krishna Maharaj. <laughs> Walk into the room. Jai, here you go. <laughs> I'm, anyway, I don't know if I should get into these stories. <laughs> but but I'll, uh, once upon a time, it's not me, there was uh, one, one of my god brothers who would not leave his room unless people were chanting his name, a crowd was chanting his name outside of his room. Wow. <laughs> it's not criticism. I mean, he's a good friend of mine. So, <laughs> that's a little too much. So, anyway. Jai me, jai me, you know. So, anyway, I mean, we were all young. We all did crazy things when, when Prabhupada left the planet, uh, we were all in our 20s, you know, mid-20s or something like that. And, you know, to have a spiritual movement, a serious spiritual movement in the hands of 20-year-old kids is a recipe for disaster. You know, and shoo, somehow or other, we made it. <laughs> we made it, oh my God. I don't know how we made it. I mean, that's because it's Krishna's mercy, it's Prabhupada's desire. Mm. Otherwise, it would be like a transcendental Lord of the Flies, you know. Mm. <laughs> you know. It, was, it was quite interesting, but I don't want it to go through another interesting time like that. Okay, I think we have to end now because I, I think I have a need for prasadam. <laughs> all the... Do you think we'll be all right tomorrow? Uh, with the rain? With the rasa, yeah. Uh, did, they, did they change the forecast? I don't know. I haven't checked this morning. But anyway, it's supposed to be heavy rain around the time of the Rathiatra, and it would be warm, and, uh, you know, they, they purchase raincoats for everybody. You know, ponchos, rain ponchos for everybody. So, I'm going. It's 100%, yeah. It's 100%. But anyway, we got to get a poncho for Lord Jagannath, too. And Subhadra and Balaram and Prabhupada. Anyway, let's see what Krishna wants.